Hello World Wide Web, I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality with a questionable grasp on reality. And with that in mind, it's time to review Phantasm Ravager. Or is it? Yes, I've already reviewed all the other movies in the franchise. Or have I? Okay, I'll stop, but you know what I'm getting at. The fifth movie, now only co-written and produced by Don Coscarelli, but directed and co-written by David Hartman, dives deep into psychological horror. My favorite kind of psychological horror. The kind where they leave so much of what is or isn't happening as ambiguous as possible, so that you never really know what's real and what's not, and I start wondering whether or not I should even bother paying attention if anything fucking matters at all. You know, that Hellraiser Inferno style of screenwriting. This also marks the final film of the Phantasm franchise. Maybe ever. It's said it was completed around 2014, but Ravager wasn't actually released to the public until 2016, shortly after the passing of Angus Scrim, and that kind of makes the concept of producing further Phantasm movies difficult. I mean, it's certainly possible, but it'd be kind of like trying to make a new Nightmare on Elm Street movie without Robert Englund. It'd be a very bad idea. Anyway, let's take a look at Phantasm Ravager and see if for once I might actually figure out what the hell's going on. In case you're wondering what happened after the end of Phantasm 4 when Reggie ran through the portal and Mike was lying in the desert alone, dying, and either Reggie went back in time to pick him up in his ice cream truck or that's just something Mike was remembering as his late dying, don't. Reggie Bannister just walks the fuck out of the desert and onto the road. At the very least, he does try to explain the plot to the audience. I can't tell what's real anymore because of him. He's a shapeshifter with superhuman strength. He enslaves the dead. Not only that, but after all the terror and destruction he brought into the world, he never stopped trying to shill his Man in the Suit brand menswear. Such evil! Also, while we're at it, we're forgetting all about the evil Jody subplot from Oblivion. Tall Man's bad, got Jody and Mike, and Reggie's here to save them. Except it's kinda hard to do that when you're starving to death. So I wander, following the Tall Man's path of destruction salvaging what I can from the remains he's left behind. Oh fuck, he's trapped in the world of Metal Gear Survive. All Reggie manages to scrounge up his bag to stick his shotgun in, and then it's back to the road. But what's this? Someone drives up in a very familiar looking car. Someone played by Daniel Schweiger, the hearse driver from Bohotep. <laughs> but he can't get away too fast. This is a horror movie. It doesn't matter that the engine was already running. The car's going to stall. This gives Reggie enough time to convince the man to give him a lift for the low, low price of $50. Of course, all Reggie really wanted to do was get in the car and talk about just how much it looks like his old car. Of course, mine had a chrome-plated 9mm loaded with steel-jacketed wad cutters in the center console. Oh, that's right. It was in the glove box. You also had a four-barrel shotgun in your bag. Might be slightly more intimidating. This means Reggie gets to keep his fifty dollars for the car and steal the man's clothes while he's at it. In case you're worried being stranded in the middle of the desert is too easy to survive. The Sentinels show up and the body count rises. They also are quite clearly CGI, but it's not so bad. Yet. It does mean we can have a car chase involving the Silver Spheres, which I'm pretty sure would be a lot harder to pull off with plastic balls on strings. The action is... well, it's choreographed okay, but it's kinda obvious that even the muzzle flash is being done in CGI. That's got me worried, but either way, Reggie takes out the balls like a total badass and rides off into the horizon. <gasps> but it was all just a dream! Like... The entire series. As explained by Mike, still played by A. Michael Baldwin, about why exactly Reggie keeps ranting and raving about these phantasms. There's been a diagnosis, and you have dementia. Oh, how the hell could he possibly know that? Well, when the doctor asked if you had any allergies, you started screaming about the undead, and then you pissed in his coffee. And... Of course, like anyone else who's been following this series, Reggie doesn't buy it. Ah, this is the one that, uh, what, this is just another one of his tricks! Oh. Yeah! I see it all now. Alright. Yeah, but once you open that can of worms in psychological horror, it's really hard to put a lid back on that shit. And don't expect them to drop this angle anytime soon, as it's instead used as a framing device for the movie to come. Reggie insists it's real, Mike says it's all in his head, and instructs the man to describe the dream he had. 
which is the movie so far, except it continues. Once Reggie's out of the desert, he encounters another hot babe to lust over for 90 or so minutes. Dawn, played by Dawn Cody. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were someone I knew. <laughs> you mean you know somebody else that drives around these parts in a black 71 Barracuda? Well, over 6,000 of those cars were made. It's not much for such an iconic vehicle, but there's more than one of them out there, son. She needs a ride, though, and Reggie needs a place to spend the night, so it's easy enough for them to help each other out here. Of course, in but a couple of minutes, Reggie is already trying to sweeten their deal in his favor. It gets hard on the road, and, and I just, yeah, I want to... Reggie, I think I see where this is going, and now I'm starting to think that maybe you should bunk outside with the horses. No, no, no. Don, you silly. I can't fuck the horses. So he gets to stay on the couch that night, writing a love song for Dawn, as he struggles to remember her name. But upstairs, the young woman is realizing that, you know what? She really would like some of that D right about now. Hey, Reggie. I was thinking... <sighs> but, Reg, how do you know she did that if you were sleeping at the time? She wanted me, I tell you! Framing this as a dream that Reggie's reciting for Mike isn't going to work so well in the long run, though, as we see when the dream leads to Reggie coming back to the old folks' home, where it seems he's been given a room with the man himself, Angus Scrim. Name's Jebediah. Been here such a long time. And while production of this film finished up about two years before its release, and Angus Scrim passed before it came out, this was also said to be one of the last scenes, if not THE last scene entirely, that the man ever was filmed for. Of course, this film wasn't filmed chronologically. Film. Film, 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 film. In case you think being back in the real world somehow means things aren't freaky anymore, don't worry. Jebediah takes this opportunity to torment Reggie and fuck with his mind even harder. I'm always watching you. But it was all just a dream! That was all just a dream! Shit, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if Reggie Bannister kicked my door in asking for help. It's gonna be a lot harder for me to get to California to ask the man to autograph a quadruple barrel shotgun. But now that he woke up at the home only to wake up at the home and then wake up at Dawn's home, he can remember her name just in time to hear those weird noises coming from upstairs and see if everybody is okay. Dawn? But the Sentinels got to her first. There goes any and all interest she might have had in Reggie's balls. Reggie, though, is interested in getting the fuck out of here and surviving until tomorrow. This gives me a new chance to bitch and moan about the CGI in this movie. Honestly, it's not good. Not only is it low quality in general, but combined with the fact that it doesn't match the shaky cam going on leaves the whole thing looking like something you'd expect out of the asylum. In slightly better news, the farmhand, Demeter, played by Daniel Roebuck, doesn't speak English and might end up killing Reggie if the man doesn't explain himself fast enough. No problem. You shut the fuck up, please! When language barriers are an issue, stick to your own tongue, only louder. It's not like they need to worry about being friends or anything anyway, considering a sentinel barges in on them. And even now, after that incredibly shit CGI shot earlier, even the physical silver balls of death are very disturbing in how closely they are shot in a way reminiscent of the asylum. But I guess I shouldn't let the cinematography get me down too bad, because it was all just a dream! And yeah, we're still going on that story Reggie's telling the Mike angle, which makes it a little hard to explain how that double wake-up worked earlier, but that's not the point. Mike's here to pull a new film theory out of his ass, with talks of parallel universes. There's this one theory called a uh, membrane theory. And it's the idea that thousands of universes are all sort of spherically stacked against one another. Their ours is just one of them. It's the usual science-ish talk about quantum physics and superpositions and things that sound mystical and magical if you don't know what they actually are. But if you do, kind of sounds like Mike's trying to sell Reggie a book of woo. Books I don't need. A fucking four-barrel shotgun is more like it. Man, you are not listening to me! Wake up! Wake up, sheeple! We don't need bookshelves, we need buckshot! 
Mike just has a chuckle at silly old Reggie going on and on about his motherfucking quadruple barrel shotgun again. He figures it's time to bring him back to his room, and we're off to see him continue the story, wandering alone in the woods. Well, almost alone. So he went from Metal Gear Survive to Destiny. That's uh, an improvement, I guess. Not only that, but a portal is nearby. And does anything matter? Like at all? When every big event is followed up by him not actually being there, at what point should I give a fuck? Deciding that he's not going to just sit around in this godforsaken old folks' home, waiting for his body to completely fail him so he can just lay down and die. Reggie stands up and marches forward! Of course, he's in the courtyard, so there's not all that many options for places he can escape to. Or is there? Watch that be some poor old lady's walker, and he just knocks a bitch out of the way like, Oh man, I'm coming for you! But Parallel Story Universe Membrane Dimension Reggie also spies a portal, and the two pass through it at the same time. Meaning only Reggie in the woods actually makes it through, but that's not the most important thing here. The tall man was on the other side. Just standing there, staring at the camera. I never realized just how boring life was for a transdimensional immortal evil. Also, Angus looks a lot younger in this scene. It's amazing what a soft focus and a lot of makeup can do for someone. Either way, Reggie doesn't try to straight up kill the guy, but argue with him. The tall man, though, does humor him with an offer. You want to see your family again? I'll give them to you. Your wife, your daughter. When the hell did Reggie have a wife and daughter? Who, who the hell are these reanimated corpses that the tall man is trying to bribe Reggie with? Reggie isn't interested in putting the romance back in necromancy, though, despite the immortal evil's warnings that he can't be beaten, so just take what you can get, man! Nevertheless, the tall man lets him go so he can think it over for a while, and Reggie leaps through the portal into a mausoleum. Well, that's always a good sign. Ah, oh, well, best to rummage through his stuff and get his guns ready. Bit of a delayed reaction there, Reg. After sneaking around a little more, managing to get the jump on the stained glass, we find out what the real horror is. The Lady in Lavender, played by Kathy Lester, according to the information I can find. Honestly, it's a tad hard to believe, because if it is the same woman from the first film, she's gotta be in at least her mid-fifties, but damn. Much more hard to believe, though, is that Reggie just lets her get nice and close to him. At least he remembers, oh yeah, all that stuff he did to help her in the first movie, it ended with her stabbing him in the gut and killing him. Uh, you know, except that it was a dream. Huh, that was a lot easier than I was expecting. Also, it seems the level the tall man built for Reggie Player 1 is just as linear as you'd expect out of a 2016 shooter. The mausoleum goes straight into a dark cave where jump scares await. Looks like someone's been practicing on House of the Dead. Must have hit the high score, too, as the level crumbles away, showing us that the tall man has returned to give him his prize. His wife and daughter, if he so chooses. That kind of makes the entire scene since the last time he offered this pointless, because Reggie still refuses to make this deal, saying that the only way he's going to leave the tall man alone is if he gets his friends back, both Mike and Jody. Why? Why are you so obsessed with these two friends? never understand. He knows what it's like to lose your two closest friends. Remember, they changed up Mike's actor in Phantasm 2, and Jody wasn't even in that one. It's called loyalty. Yeah, I'm not changing my tune here. This could very well be just a reimagining of the actual arguments between Don Coscarelli and Universal about recasting characters in Phantasm 2. As Reggie's position is unwavering, the tall man has no choice but to deal with him like the pest he is, giving him a shocking revelation. You're not even real. You're my bad dream. But what was all just a dream, and then all just a dream was all just a dream! Jesus Christ, this is starting to make Inception look like a slice of life film. So welcome to the real world, motherfucker! Reggie's still in his ice cream man outfit, but he's strapped to a slab and there's all kinds of horrifying mechanisms surrounding him. At least for a short while, a couple mysterious figures arrive and cut him loose. This would be Chunk, played by Steven Jutras, and this lady over here... Don? No, 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 it can't be you. I, 
Yeah, I saw you sliced and diced in, in, in your uh, own bedroom. I think you got me confused with somebody else, buddy. My name's Jane. Okay, I'm not sure if the movie's trying to scare us or save money on actresses. Unsurprisingly, telling the woman who's not the one you think she is how much you think she is the one you think she is and how much you tried to get into her pants before her brains were drilled out doesn't get him anywhere. She simply tells him that they have a safe place to bring him, and he is a survivor and all, and instructs him to stick together with Chunk. You can either stay here with the brain between those two chrome things, or you can bring your ass with me. I wonder if they'll shoehorn into the plot that all this time Reggie's baldness was actually the result of the chrome bar brain fuckery that's been going on. On the way out, they cover the basics. The whole thing is the fault of a mysterious figure known only as the Tall Man, which we uh, kind of already know. But the chrome headrest is a thought-sucking machine used to extract information from his captured subjects. Also, we learn Reggie is terrible at following directions and not splitting up, instead heading off into a dark room on his own to investigate a burnt corpse. Ah! Well, it's good to know the acting isn't any worse than it was in the first movie. So, Reggie, you've been through quite a bit. Maybe find something a little scarier to actually scream at? Yeah, I like that. That works. All this screaming does get Chunk's attention. Hold still, Grandpa. No! He helped you. What the fuck was that? No! As Reggie ran off on his own, is clearly delusional, and screamed no at a lurker being killed, Chunk agrees that it's best he's armed as well, and they press on, finding more members of the Tall Man Resistance. Well, that's a fine way to not meet his demands, Mr. Tall Man, sir. Oh, you don't want him to go and save Mike? Well, fine. You just go off on your own and meet back up with Mike. Ha! Huh. But I didn't send Jody there with you. Ooh! Tall Man, you trickster, you! All this talk about the Resistance and Survivors might have you wondering a few things, though, so Mike fills out most of the important plot points. Remember that cancelled version of Phantasm IV written by Roger Avery called Phantasm's End? Yeah, we're pretty much using that, but didn't give Roger any writing credits in this. The Tall Man has taken over everything, and only a few pockets of Survivors even exist anymore. On the surface, it's all out war between the Tall Man's armies of Sentinels, Lurkers, and Zombies against the entire human race! because it was all just a fucking dream! Reggie's back in the nursing home, confused and wandering around, looking somewhere, anywhere, for a cohesive plot. Oh. We need to get you back to your room. Jeez, lady, you work in a nursing home. Maybe don't jump scare the old folks. And he hopes of figuring out what's real or a dream or what goes right out the window as a scuffle with an earth turns into a scuffle with a zombie minion. Mike and friends manage to save Reggie, but that just leads to him waking up in his room anyway, back in the home. At least this time, when Mike shows up looking a little more disheveled than usual for this dimension, he actually seems to believe Reggie a bit more. Last night, he had that dream where he went on that big adventure in Phantasm 1 through 4. Maybe not 2, but the point is, we find out what happened after Phantasm 4. You went after the tall man, and I, I, I found myself in the desert, alone, following his path of destruction. He just got the fuck up and started walking. I figured he'd lived, but I kind of thought it would be a little more eventful than that. The real story kicks off after he leaves the desert, though, and his dream is turned into reel after reel of stock footage, with phantasm shit CGI'd in. Remember that story Reggie already told Mike in the other world? It's pretty much that, with visual aids. It's also still the story he's telling him in the other world. What a fine use of our time that was. It's amazing, with all of these filler scenes, this still somehow managed to be the shortest Phantasm movie of all of them. I mean, not by much, they're all about 90 minutes, but still. All up to speed, Reggie decides, fuck it, he's out, gonna walk out into this hallway and leave the movie. But what's this? The tall man himself has arrived to stop him. So Mike unleashes the awesome power of a motherfucking rocket launcher! Oh, who could have guessed that would have happened? Shortly after, though, Mike shows up and tells Reggie they gotta get out of here. So they move to escape, both from the hospital and from the Silent Hill-esque dark world, and right through a portal into the tall man's planet of red and shit. The tall man's there, and he has Dawn. Or Jane. More importantly, he explains why they can't kill him. 
There are thousands of me. Tens of thousands. I'm in dimensions you cannot possibly imagine. You got the Mario Maker extra lives. Unlike Jane. Oh no. The lady with five lines died. Again. It's not going to go unpunished though. Chunk is here and blows himself the fuck up. Therefore, it was all just a dream, yada yada, but when wandering around outside, Reggie sees Mike again and gets his quadruple barreled shotgun. I was really hoping that the doctors would actually react to him having a quadruple barreled shotgun. I mean, I know that would spoil the whole is it or is it not a dream angle, but I'd really like to see is it a dream blown out of the fucking water at this point. But who would happen to roll up but Jody, still played by Bill Thornbury. Yeah, he's dead and then died and then Mike killed him twice, but now he's alive and here and a friend and just forget all about that shit from before, okay? Mike, Reggie, and Jody are reunited and that's all that matters. But it was all just a deathbed hallucination! Reggie's back in the old folks' home with Mike and now Jody, who has arrived to be there for him as he fucking dies of old age. And the body count rises. I think I just realized why I never made it through medical school. And thus, the movie comes to a close. Just kidding! It's time for a mid credit sequence! Remember how Rocky drove off after Phantasm 3? Well, she lived. Also, so did Chunk. Yeah, he blew himself up as a means to take out the tall man, but... Eh, no bother. They're meeting back up with the gang to all head north to the cold, where the tall man can't get them. Okay, I'm not 100% on the cardinal directions here, but I'm pretty sure that direction... You, the tall man's minions, waiting! Anyway, that was Phantasm Ravager, and... It's almost good. There's a ton of issues I have with this one, but that's not to say it's a terrible movie. While the film wasn't entirely the brainchild or vision of Don Coscarelli this time, the concepts put forth weren't that great of a deviation from the usual world of Phantasm. Well, to be fair, you could have dinosaurs with jetpacks and cyborg women with laser cannons for tits, and it'd still somehow work as a Phantasm movie. But while I didn't think the concepts were bad, the execution, that leaves a lot to be desired. The idea of not being sure what is real and what isn't, if this is a dream or another dimension, or a dream of another dimension and a trip down dementia, it can be unsettling, that is, if it's abnormal. However, when the entire film, from start to finish, pounds the point home over and over and over again that it's a dream or a delusion or any other kind of thing that means the last ten minutes may as well have not have happened, it gets more than a little tiresome. Yes, there are conversations to be had about what is or isn't real and what it all means. The problem is, I don't care. The movie spent so long jerking the viewer around about what is reality, it forgot to get anything done with the story within. So it's either the tale of Reggie looking for Mike, finding Mike and leaving, or going insane and dying. Great options! At the end of the day, Phantasm Ravager is... watchable? Mostly. The effects were disturbing for all the wrong reasons, and long, suspenseful, establishing shots don't work so good when it's all just a dream anyway. But it's not the worst movie ever made or anything like that, coming in at two terrifying tall man territories out of five. It's amazing just how bad of a wreck you can get into by not letting Don Coscarelli drive. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, it was all just a dream! <gasps> Man, I never actually did a review? Well, that hardly seems fair.
What a fine use of our time that was.